First question is from C Pickens 7. Does lifting to failure bodybuilding style tax the CNS like lifting heavy powerlifting type maxing? The right. reason why you have to you have to put in what they wrote there because it it makes a difference, right? And could and correct me if I'm wrong. I think that this person is uh, alluding to like bodybuilder style workouts tend to be uh, isolation exercises primarily. Mm -hmm. They don't do a lot of compound lifting where the opposite is true with powerlifting. Powerlifting is all compound lifting, yeah, right? That's okay. primarily prim Yeah. So, you know, when you train, uh, if you work out with any type of intensity or volume, there's always going to be a, a you're always going to challenge the central nervous system a little bit. And if you over challenge the CNS, it needs to take time to recover. And this can be a problem when you're trying to build muscle or improve or whatever you know, your physique. Now, the main, the first part about lifting to failure. Now, here's the deal with lifting to failure. You know, when I was a kid, it was told to me, or at least I read in every bodybuilding magazine, that lifting to failure was super important because you need to work out intensely in order to send the muscle building signal. And because failure, because there was nothing beyond failure, except you could do like forced reps and stuff. But other than that, if you went to failure, you know you went past the point of sending that signal. And in theory, it sounded good. Now, here's the deal. One of the most mind-blowing changes I ever made to my training was in my 20s, in my late 20s, where I stopped training to failure. And I did this because I started to look at strength athletes programming. Power lifters, Olympic lifters rarely ever lift to failure. They just don't do it very often. Oftentimes, going to failure is on the day of the competition. And I thought, God, I wonder if that will benefit me. I stopped lifting to failure, started training to intensely, but I would stop about two to three reps before I thought I would fail, and uh, my body just responded. The studies now support this. Studies now show that intensity, uh, that going to failure is too much intensity. It's too much intensity for most people. Occasionally going to failure is okay, so you know where it's at, but as a tool to get your body to improve, uh, it's too much. It's too yeah. much. It'll slow down your progress. I, yeah. I was kind of reading this question a little bit differently. Like, um, so in terms of like hypertrophy and, and, and trying to max out and, and going to, to the point of like pure fatigue. Like, so if I'm, I'm getting that sort of, uh, where, where my muscles feel like super tight and I can't even perform the rep anymore. And then I'm, I'm tired, I'm fatigued versus maxing out completely and going to failure, you know, doing a heavy compound lift, like a deadlift or, you know, a, a bench press or something like there's a little bit more of a dire consequence to one versus yeah. the other. You know, that's exactly how I read this. I read this as somebody is comparing bodybuilding type training. Let's let, and of course we're over generalizing this, but that is more like going to failure on leg press and, uh, leg extension. and leg, leg extensions, curl. yeah, okay. Versus the the guy or girl who goes to failure on a squat or a deadlift. Which one's more taxing for the CNS? Well, that's obvious, yeah. Well, it's yeah. obvious to us, but I think that's why they, this person's asking this question yeah, yeah. because there's a lot of bodybuilders. There's a lot of bodybuilders that that have incredible, you know, pro physiques that train to failure all the time, but they never do these compound lifts. Mm -hmm. And this is part of why they get away with that. They get away with that because it isn't as taxing on the body as going to failure on a deadlift or on a squat. You can go to failure on a leg press and rec recover a lot quicker than you could doing that from a squat. That's true. Which yeah. is also true why you don't get as much bang for your buck, though, too. Yeah, that's yeah. true. That's, you know, not all exercises, all you know, exercises are different. They're not all equal, and some give you better results than others, and some tax your body more than others. And isolation movements tend to tax your body a lot less. Than compound movement, so going to failure on an isol on a bicep curl is not as bad, I would say, uh, as going to you know failure on a, on like a, a pull up, which both hits the biceps pretty well, but one is a compound exercise. This is mm -hmm. also how I would modify my training sometimes when, let's say, you know, because we we tend to you know push people in the direction of more of the bang for your best bang for your buck exercises like the compound lifts. So of course my most of my programming is built around that. But every once in a while I get I overextend and I train really hard. Let's say and my and I, I really get after squats and then I'm, my my hips are sore. But then here I am back two days later and I'm supposed to do you know front squats or something mm -hmm. else. This is sometimes where I go. Oh, I'm gonna leg press today. Or oh, I'm going to do some machine work because it's on less it. of a challenge. Exactly. Body. So yeah. th th I mean, so I think the question's a good question if I'm if I'm receiving it correctly. That yeah, they they, they are different. Yeah. Um, but and, you know, back to what I was saying originally, I just think this is an important message. No, you're uh, right. You're right. For, for if you're listening or watching this, 
Tra- don't if you go to failure in your workout, stop doing that. Well, and watch what happens. You'll well, actually progress. Well, we've, it'll make a massive. Difference. We've talked many times before about paradigm shattering moments in our career. Uh, this was one of them for me. Like you, I went through a phase of leaving two in the tank. Um, I don't remember who I heard that from first or what got me to do that. But for a extended period of time, I said, okay, I, for so many years, I was the kid who wanted a spotter. Everything was to failure, forced reps, mm-hmm. because I thought that's what I need to grow. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and put this into practice and see if I go the complete opposite. What kind of? And I saw huge benefits from it. Yeah. Strength gains, muscle gains, mm-hmm. uh, and I had already been lifting for a really long time. So it blew my mind that it, that training that way. And don't forget too, when you get to those levels of pushing to failure, that's where the the, the risk also increases. Mm-hmm. So if I'm not going to get that much more gains from it. Or not, or not even as much gains from it, and then also increase the risk. Why would you almost right. ever do and, it? It and, should be something that you rarely do. Right, and then also low rep sets, even if they're intense, tend to cause less uh, stress on the body than higher rep sets. Uh, you know, it's within reason. So, if I do a set of you know squats and I'm maxing out at two reps, and even if I'm going to failure for two reps. It's actually not going to tax my body as if I was doing the same thing with 15 reps and going to failure on 15 reps. So you also have to calculate all the volume, and volume includes the total amount of reps that you're doing in your workout. So it's really important to understand that the right dose is best. That's what's going to get you there the fastest. More or less than that will get you there slower. And if you're a fitness fanatic, realize that your tendency is to try to do more. So always, in my opinion, err on the side of less, and you'll probably do better.